Hello and welcome to Start USA Training. Today is July 14th and we'll be talking about duty preference programs. We are recording this webinar and the recording and other materials will be made available after the broadcast. Uh, everybody is currently muted uh, and the Q&A feature is available if you have any questions, so please make use of that. Uh, we'll answer questions throughout, but uh, we'll take some more time at the end for those specifically as well. <clears throat> Just a quick introduction, introduction to Star USA. Uh, we're a firm specializing in developing international trade operations for companies that uh, act on a global scale. That includes process development, full scale operations, consulting, advice, and training in all areas of international trade. Uh, we do have our customs broker exam prep course. Uh, enrollment is open now. Uh, feel free to go to that link on the page there, starusa.org slash training, if you'd like to register for the customs broker exam preparation course. My name is Michael Easton. I am the president and general manager of Star USA. Uh, we're a uh, firm specializing in uh, import and export compliance uh, based out of Northeast Ohio. Uh, my focus is on operational ex excellence, verifiable progress, and sustainable compliance. Uh, and with me on the call today is Joe Harper. Good morning. I'm a principal here at Star USA. I have been doing this for over a decade. I am a giant nerd about compliance, and uh, I think it's really fun to just say I'm an import and export at parties because that gets the conversation going well. Thank you. And we're away. So this webinar is really tailored to the U.S. importer. Duties assessed on goods at the time of import. So if you're not importing the items, you're not paying that duty. And several of the remedies that we're talking about are specific to US programs. A few of them can be generalized to other countries, but that's not our focus today. We're not really going to hit on that. We are going to cover a lot of ground today and we'll use a lot of industry terms. If you want us to slow down, hit that handy zoom button or you can type into the chat or Q&A and we'll circle back on anything. We're going to operate under the assumption that everyone on this Zoom knows that duty is a tax that's assigned to goods at import and it comes in several modes. So it can get assigned as a percentage of value, as an amount per weight or count or measure, or it can be just a set amount for an item. There's also several types of duty unique to each country and even within each country they can be unique to types per class of good or the like. So again, we're heavily focused on US duty and how that affects you, the person who's paying it. Today, we'll frame several ways to avoid, defer, minimize, or recover your duty. If you need more information on any of these elements after the session, Customs provides copious resources, and we definitely recommend that you reach out to an expert in order to get more information on your specific situation. Duty is usually assigned at the tariff item level, which is the seventh and eighth digits of the HTS classification. So accurate classification of your goods is an essential element. It's really the cornerstone of doing international business. And it's your responsibility as the importer to ensure that the appropriate classification of goods is made. We won't cover every duty preference program that exists, but we hope to give you a frame of reference for considering their, your import profile and recognizing some new advantages or opportunities. Thanks, Michael. We're going to chat about some of the types of duty that you might run into in the course of doing business. If they catch you by surprise, especially some of these ones that we'll go over next, they can be very disconcerting to say the least or potentially bankrupting. So it's good to have a solid understanding of what you need to keep an eye out for as you're purchasing and sourcing. The U.S. doesn't have a tax on imports like VAT or GST, though, which is really nice. Those can be a significant chunk of change when you're importing into other countries. So for this slide, get, get your notes out because I didn't itemize all of the important things on the slide, even though you will get the slides and you will get the reporting afterward. There's some stuff for each of these that you'll wanna understand. So 
ADCBD is anti-dumping and countervailing duties. And those are special trade remedies that are designed to address unfair international situations when there's sufficient proof of injurious practices. Dumping is a situation where products are manufactured overseas and then they're sold by foreign firms here in the United States at prices below the price they sell in their own home market. Anti-dumping and countervailing duties are both WTO sanctioned responses by a government to those practices. In this case, sanctioned means a good thing instead of a bad thing. So countervailing duties are designed to offset subsidies that are provided to foreign manufacturers by their governments. And those subsidies allow them to produce and sell goods at lower prices than our domestic producers can. And part of establishing duties on goods is proof that there are subsidies by foreign governments and proof that those lower prices are causing injury to our domestic producers. So the investigations can take a while and you might see them occur over the course of years. And then all of a sudden there's duties assessed. And those duties are often very high. They range from 20% to 500% assessed on the value of the good. One way you can keep an eye out for those is watch for a pricing situation that's very imbalanced between a foreign producer and domestic producers. A lot of sourcing was caught off guard by the anti-dumping duties on aluminum from China, but those were situations where they were able to get landed cost aluminum from China, and Michael will talk more about landed cost, at a hugely different price than what they could get from US producers. And after that, it occurred for a year or two, the ITC here, the International Trade Commission, was alerted to it and they established anti-dumping. So we here in the US are the World Trade Organization member with the most anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases against other countries. And common items are things like metals, chemicals, machinery, food, solar panels, plastics, textiles, etc. So one fun thing to keep in mind, this is where you're going to see my compliance nerd come out. One fun thing about ADCBD is that it's not limited to an HTS code like general rates of duty are. Even though the orders will have some suggested HTS codes, your product has to fit the, the order scope. And it you will have duties assessed on it even if your product isn't classified under one of those suggested HTS. So you have to wade through very dense ADCBD order scopes to determine if your items are subject to it. You know, and in oh. ad addition, sorry, Joe. No, <laughs> good. Um, in addition to, to seeing if your product falls in that scope, um, if you're skirting the edge of it, getting a scope ruling is probably your, your most advantageous path forward because you don't want to run a foul of ADCBD uh, and have it assessed retroactively. So getting that, that scope ruling to see if your product actually falls within that specific scope is a, is a good way to move forward on solid ground. Yes, so you can, you can do that a couple of ways. You can file for a scope ruling. And if you import something under one of the HTS that's flagged for an anti-dumping order and it absolutely does not fit, we strongly recommend either getting an order getting a ruling, or you can reach out to an expert who can write you up an overview of that product. Because when there's items that are imported in an HTS that fit a, an order, an anti-dumping or countervailing order, customs will eventually come to you and ask for proof that your item doesn't go in there. And sometimes that's really, really obvious. And in those cases, you can reach out to someone to have on hand a write-up of your product and an analysis of why it doesn't meet the scope order. So you wouldn't have to go through the process of a ruling, but you have a document on hand that you can provide to customs if they ask questions. 
So Section 232, these are duties that are legal under the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, and they're run by the Department of Commerce. The basis of 232 is threats to national security. So in 2018, they published reports on steel and aluminum, indicating that our domestic production of steel and aluminum was very low, and that was a threat to national security. And that resulted in duties being assessed for, for steel and aluminum imports. And the aim is to protect and expand our domestic steel and aluminum production. So there's also duties assessed on derivative products of steel and aluminum, and there's new investigations on uranium underway. So this is something to keep an eye on, make sure that when you're sourcing, you're factoring that into the cost. And there are exceptions on, in terms of which countries are subject to the 232 duties. Section 301, is legal under Trade Act of 1974, and that allows the U.S. Trade Representative to respond to practices or policies of a foreign government that are deemed unjustified, unreasonable, discriminatory, or that burden U.S. commerce. So one that you have almost certainly heard about are the duties that are in place for China beginning in the middle of 2018, but there's also 301 duties assessed in response to European Union beef, large civil aircraft, and the digital services tax. The U.S. didn't like those practices and we assess duties on products from those countries in order to discourage the continuation of those practices. And then quota. So quota can mean a few things. There's quotas that let you bring in a certain amount of items at a free or reduced rate and then all imports of those products after that amount are brought in at full rate of duty. Those kinds of quotas are called tariff rate quotas. And then there's absolute quotas. And absolute quotas mean that there's again a certain amount of goods that you can bring in, but then after that amount of goods is hit, and it's unfortunately not just by you, it's by everybody in the United States, then you're no longer allowed to import that good at all. And we have some absolute quotas on steel items from South Korea, and then we have on things like machinery and food items, especially sugar. Sugar's a pretty hot one. Okay, uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about duty avoidance. Um, duty avoidance is probably the first and best, me best method to achieving that competitive advantage that we're shooting for. Um, you, you get the advantage by not paying that duty out in the first place, which is the best option. So if the money never leaves your pocket, you don't have to worry about the complexities of getting it back. And I kind of think of it like income tax withholdings. Uh, if you withhold too much, uh, Uncle Sam gets to use that money all year long, however he likes. And then at the end of the year, you file your tax return, you get some of that back. But meanwhile, you're working with less cash throughout the year, uh, so you can do uh, less with your, with your business or with uh, your personal finances if you don't have that cash. So we want to avoid paying that uh, in every case that we possibly can. And one of the first things that we have to do is recognize how duty plays uh, into our role in the transaction. And one of the ways that we can do that is by doing landed cost calculations. And I'm not going to get into the full scope of how to actually evaluate landed cost on today's webinar. It's a bigger topic for another day. But we do want to talk about uh, some of the elements that can impact that duty profile. And when it comes to, to duty recognition, uh, the U.S. is considered an FOB country. Most, most of the rest of the world, meanwhile, uh, assesses duty on a CIF basis. And that's a key contrast to kind of recognize. And when I say FOB and CIF, I'm not talking about INCO terms. Uh, being an FOB country means that duty is assessed on the cost to get the goods laden on board the vessel, but does not include the cost of things like freight or insurance from the port of departure. Uh, and uh, CIF countries, on the other hand, will assess duty on the goods, the freight, and the insurance, and everything that goes into that package to get the goods to the country. So the difference there being, in the U.S., we uh, assess duty on uh, the goods to get the goods out of the foreign country, whereas most other countries will assess the uh, duty on the cost to get the goods into the country. Additionally, in most CIF countries, uh, there's a VAT tax, 
and they'll tax both the cost of the goods as well as the duty. So it'll be a compounding um, cost there. Uh, anyone that's attended our Incoterms webinars uh, in the past may recall that the U.S. has a lot of confusion with the Incoterm FOB. Uh, FOB is used in the Uniform Commercial Code as a term for domestic transportation. It's also used for pricing purposes as a precursor to determining your duty profile, like we're talking about here in this context. And it's also an Incoterm rule. So FOB has three concurrent meetings that have no relation to one another, uh, and it all depends on the, on the scope of what you're talking about. So I just want to kind of draw attention to that FOB differentiation there. So the U.S. is an FOB country, and we assess duty to get the goods uh, basically laden on board the vessel in that foreign country. So the dutyable charges for the U.S. would include the full value of the merchandise, and that's including the assist values. Uh, it also uh, includes the packing costs to get the goods ready for transportation and any pre-carriage costs, which is basically getting the goods from the point of manufacture, the point of departure, to that first port of departure, so that inland transportation in that foreign country. Meanwhile, the main carriage, which is typically ocean or air, and the on carriage from the port of arrival to the final destination here in the U.S., uh, the marine insurance, the brokerage charges, um, loading charges, customs fees, those things are not actually dutiable. And you want to be careful in how you set your transactions up so that those costs aren't rolled into the, the price on that commercial invoice. Uh, because if you're declaring a different value than what's on your invoice, uh, you need to be able to defend that. And that's, that's one of the key reasons why I generally recommend caution when buying goods on a delivered basis. Everybody loves buying delivered because it's so much less work. But you may be spending more and compounding that spending by having to pay duty on that additional cost uh, if you're not careful how you set those things up. So if you're buying goods on a delivered basis, and delivered basis, income terms wise, I'm looking at uh, C terms and D terms primarily, uh, you want to make sure that you are accounting for the cost of transportation so that you don't have to include those into your reported entered value. <clears throat> The trick with that is that you have to actually have evidence to uh, show that you don't need to account those costs. And the evidence that's, that customs expects you to have is typically a rated bill of lading. You need to be able to show that these costs were paid to this carrier for this particular type of transportation. And that rated bill of lading is that evidence that they ask for the most often. Uh, and that way, if you have that evidence, you can deduct that cost from your entered value and you don't have to pay uh, the duty on that. Uh, on the flip side, there is a flip side here too. Um, any dutyable costs that were excluded from the invoice value actually have to be added back in. And you want to be careful about how you're doing your calculations and, and running your land cost analysis to ensure that you're covering uh, all of the appropriate costs and putting the right costs into the right buckets so that you're not paying unnecessary duty. Customs tends to take it uh, poorly when they have to um, go back and collect duty from you that they rightfully owe or are owed. Okay, the first sale rule. So this occurs uh, when a foreign manufacturer transfers ownership to a foreign intermediary for the express purpose of selling the merchandise to the U.S. So there's three parties in the transaction, the foreign manufacturer, the foreign intermediary, and the U.S. buyer. U.S. importers can actually pay duty on the value of the merchandise at the time it was sold to the foreign intermediary. Not the, do, not the price that it was uh, sold from the foreign intermediary to the U.S. buyer, if you have the evidence available to support that. Um, you, it has to be a bona fide sale. It has to qualify as an arm's length transaction between all parties. Uh, the goods have to be clearly destined for export. And the terms and agreements uh, between those parties, all three of those parties, are subject to customs review. And first sale is generally less common than it was in the past. Uh, as foreign companies have gotten more tools and are able to find buyers in the U.S. a little bit more easily, more directly than they could in the past, uh, with the advent of the internet and just direct sales are, have gotten easier. But it is still a foundational element for certain industries, and it is still part of legacy contracts and practices that exist, uh, where a, an intermediary will act as the selling agent or the buyer's agent. Um, but generally, it's, it's optimal to buy directly from the seller wherever possible so that you can avoid having to deal with this first sale rule because it is, it is complicated to uh, enforce and demonstrate your compliance with it. Uh, the first sale audits are fairly extensive. They review a lot of documentation. Um, and it's often um, 
questionable whether that risk is worth having. So if you, if you find yourself using the first sale rule uh, extensively, I would first question the necessity for it in, in the nature of the transaction and whether or not you can actually buy directly from the manufacturer and get the goods at that reduced price anyways uh, without having to go through the intermediary. And if that's not possible, then obviously you have to go through all of those, um, the requirements to meet that, that uh, threshold. <clears throat> So being, being aware of those additional complexities, and that's gonna be true for all of these programs. Every single one of the programs that we're talking about today is going to have a threshold that you're expected to meet in order to demonstrate why you do not have to pay this duty or why you're allowed to get this student back. So you wanna pay attention to those requirements and make sure that you're a thorough understanding of those throughout uh, any of these programs. Additionally, there are, um, duty preference programs. Uh, and they're one of the strongest tools in your arsenal and they, they're used extensively today. Um, they're very widespread. Uh, we're mostly talking about um, free trade agreements, trade promotion agreements, things like that. Um, recognizing how these impact your supply chain, either directly or indirectly. Uh, I know a lot of companies that purchase from a domestic supplier and that domestic supplier is actually sourcing internationally. And the role of duty preference programs is not considered in that transaction. And there could be advantage, uh, cost advantage, in making sure that you understand the entirety of your supply chain, even if you're a domestic, um, you only buy from domestic sources. And just to, to contrast a little bit to uh, free trade agreements and, and TPAs are generally bilateral or multilater multilateral. And that means that all the countries agree to a specific set of mutual criteria that apply mostly the same way to all parties involved. Uh, it's generally a tool used with fully developed nations to promote fair trade and other mutually beneficial economic interests between those parties. Uh, the US has free trade agreements or trade promotion agreements in place with, uh, I believe, 20 countries today. Uh, there's word of additional trade agreements being discussed that pops up every few months. Um, we pay attention to that news. Obviously, USMCA just went into effect uh, this month and that has shifted the landscape from NAFTA to USMCA. But free trade agreements, trade promotion agreements are generally the most comprehensive economic agreement, agreements uh, that countries can agree to, and they tend to touch on basically every possible industry in some way or another. Uh, recognizing how your industry can benefit from those trade uh, agreements is a, a major tool for avoiding paying duty in the first place by doing uh, legwork upfront to achieve the threshold that you need to meet. <clears throat> there are other trade preference programs, uh, the most common, uh, most recognizable, which is the Generalized System of Preferences, GSP. And these are, are unilateral uh, in that they apply different sets of criteria to the participating countries. So the U.S. is generally seeking things like intellectual property rules, enforcement uh, rules and laws on the use of forced labor, priority access to sectors like banking and finance within those foreign countries. Uh, in, in exchange, the U.S. will incentivize companies here in the U.S. to buy from these other countries by reducing that rate of duty. So they create that, that monetary incentive by saying, hey, it's cheaper if you buy this same stuff from these GSP countries than if you were to buy them from another country. And the U.S. does that because they're getting something in exchange. <clears throat> Annually, the U.S. trade representative, the USTR, uh, will conduct an assessment on some various members of GSP to determine whether those countries are adhering to the practices that they agreed to in order to be part of that GSP program. And depending on the results of those findings, the U.S. Trade Rep will uh, occasionally recommend uh, suspension or removal from the program if they're not found to be complying with the way that we expect them to be. And GSP is, is kind of a big deal. It hits uh, more than 100 different countries and territories. Uh, it gets renewed uh, periodically for a period of generally one to three years by Congress. Um, but in recent years, those of you that have been paying attention to GSP will, will know that there's been some um, delays with those renewals in GSP and it's caused uh, effectively uh, a suspension of that duty preference uh, for a period of time until Congress can reinstate GSP, in which case the entries that were made during that lapsed time period are still eligible for the GSP benefits, but there's a process to go back and, and collect that duty. Um, in order to, to actually have gotten that benefit. So the government actually took the funds in, form, in the form of duty during that time period and then gave them back after the fact. In addition, uh, there's been some 
changes recently in the last couple of years uh, with the GSP member countries. India and Turkey were both removed last year, early last year. Uh, Thailand was uh, had a partial suspension for about six months. Um, and, and those changes happen on a, on a regular basis. There's a lot of uh, political pressure from, from multiple sides in order to achieve a certain outcome. So you need to be alert to how your supply chain is impacted <clears throat> by things like GSP, by things like trade promotion agreements and, and free trade agreements. <clears throat> and there's a lot of a lot of information out there. Um, in, in recent years, it's been to the level of mainstream media, but Customs also publishes a lot of information. The U.S. Trade Representative publishes a lot of information. The U.S. International Trade uh, Council also publishes a lot. Um, you, you can find out more in the HTS U.S. General Notes, will, which will lay out the practices for how to adhere to these programs. Um, and they can get pretty technical, uh, but there's there's lots of us out there with uh, prior experience that can help you navigate how to take advantage of these. And we're looking at 20 countries with free trade agreements and more than 100 countries uh, in, in the GSP, uh, there's, a, there's a good chance that your source of goods, if it's not China, uh, is going to be eligible for some program or another in some ways. So you wanna be alert to, to those benefits and, and where they exist. Okay, next up on duty avoid, avoidance is tariff engineering. And tariff engineering, uh, it's one of those uh, phrases that sounds illegal but isn't, uh, unless you are actually doing it in order to skirt the rules or skirt, skirt the law and you actually undo the modifications. But what we're talking about with tariff engineering is intentional modification uh, of your manufacturing processes prior to import in order to achieve a specific HTS classification. And that HTS classification presumably will have a, a reduced or free rate of duty. So you, you do something additional or you stop doing something in a foreign country in order to get a certain rate of duty, you import it, and then you take the next steps with the product. Um, this, is a, this is one of the um, more challenging uh, things operationally to enforce an organization because it requires a, a lot of planning and a lot of uh, strategy to be enforced throughout your supply chain. It may require you to, to find another supply chain partner in another country in order to uh, achieve the thresholds of what tariff engineering is, but it is a very effective tool for reducing that cost uh, from, from a duty outlay perspective. There was a, <clears throat> there was a uh, example from um, last year, I believe it was 2019, uh, where Columbia Sportswear had, uh, they modify their clothing uh, to include an additional pocket. Uh, and that inclusion of that pocket allows that good, uh, that, that category of goods to be classified in a different HTS than if that pocket were not there. And so you can buy these, these clothes with that pocket off the shelves. Uh, and the reason that pocket is there is not for any aesthetic purposes. It doesn't, it's not a fashion statement. They're literally just trying to reduce the duty on the import of this type of good versus the type of the good that had it without the pocket. So there's a lot of uh, different opportunities out there uh, that you can tap into. Your chapstick pocket saves Columbia Sportswear 9% on duty, which is great. Yeah, and that, that in turn, hypothetically, saves you at the, uh, at the store. Yes. So then there's chapter 98, which is a treasure trove. It is 24, I believe, subchapters, and each of those subchapters has pages and pages of notes that outline how you specifically meet it. But what it does is it's special programs that allow you to import certain items duty-free. So probably the most famous of this is U.S. Goods Returned, you might see USGR. But one thing that a lot of people don't know is that two years ago, they expanded it so that it is US goods returned or foreign goods returned that you imported, paid duty on, and then exported them. And then within three years of export, you're bringing them back. And you can claim no duty when you bring it back because you've already paid the US government duty on those items. Mm -hmm. So this chapter is full of opportunities for duty avoidance and the key is knowing your products, the legal loopholes that are present and the requirements for meeting them. So you'll see on the top of the right column that there's temporary import under bond. I'm not gonna dig into that on this slide because we'll go into it in depth 
later, but this is really neat. You can bring in tools of trade duty free. You can bring in things that you exported for repair or alteration. You had them repaired and you're bringing them back without paying duty on that machine all over again. Yeah, I it, actually have a case example I want to throw in there. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a company that I worked with years ago that had uh, very specialized metal plates that they used for cutting. Uh, and these plates, these cutting blades um, were manufactured in, in, I believe, Germany, and they were specialized to a spe specific factory that could make them to this, to this caliber and to this, this type of thing. And every couple of years, they had to send these plates back. So they would alternate them. So every year there was another shipment of plates going back to be repaired and then being re-imported back. And these plates are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and initially the company was paying uh, duty on the re-import of those plates because they had been, um, kind of manufactured, they were country of origin, Germany, uh, all of that was still true. Uh, but then they found this exported for repair or alteration provision in, in chapter 98 that allowed them to only pay duty on the cost of the repairs themselves and not on the value of the good. They had to um, maintain a pretty accurate records in order to illustrate um, the cost of the goods before they were exported and the value and the, the usage and the depreciation. Uh, but they were able to avoid paying tens of thousands of dollars of duty every year by uh, implementing this repair or alteration provision of Chapter 98. Yeah, if you have frequent uses of those kinds of things, just like instruments of international traffic, where if you have uh, reusable containers or totes that are specialized to your industry that you're exporting and then bringing back in over and over, you can get those imported as instruments of international traffic and then you don't pay duty on them. This is also true for personal effects, things that are imported specifically for religious, educational, or scientific uses. Um, if animals that strayed over the border that you're bringing back in, uh, visiting dignitaries can bring their I want to be personal the, effects I want to be the in. Shepherd that is trying to just <laughs> back across the border. It has to, to fill out all that paperwork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to talk to that guy. I, I do not. Um, you can also get things like defective metal ingots or specific shapes of metal that don't conform to specs. Um, ski racing or theater scenery, things that are used for temporary items. And then there's the last several chapters, sub chapters of 98 are specifically about textiles and free trade agreements. Things like uh, American Growth or African Growth and Opportunity Act and uh, Caribbean Basin Economic Recovery. So there's, there's all sorts of opportunities and knowing your specific practices and the options available are what is helpful for Chapter 98. All right, Michael, next slide when you're ready. All right, so duty deferral is the practice of delaying your payment of duty for as long as possible. And the thinking here is that the working capital is better left in your pockets than anyone else's, and you wanna stage your spending in a deliberate way that maximizes your value position. In some cases, you can avoid paying the duty altogether, but if the goods stay in the country, you probably are going to have to pay it eventually. And one, one key example of this is the GSP refunds that Michael was talking about. So that happened, I believe, 2018, really early 2018. And we have clients that were still chasing their refunds, their supposedly automatic refunds that still haven't been paid for GSP that they paid during that time. Mm -hmm. So one of the coolest programs that exists under this, if you do manufacturing or you bring things in for short periods of time, is the Temporary Importation Under Bond, or TIB. That's a Chapter 98 provision, 9813. And it requires specific paperwork and that you meet really necessary requirements. And if you fail to do that, then you pay two times the amount of duty if you do it, you pay no duty. So usually goods are imported for a year and then re-exported with a letter to the port or center identifying that the items were exported. 
And then you can also request extensions, which can be granted for a total of up to three years in the country. This is in 19 CFR 10.31 uh, to 10.40, if you're interested in taking a look at that. Merchandise that you bring in under TIB can be further manufactured while it's in the country, which is why it's fantastic for manufacturing purposes. But the materials that you use in manufacture can't be used for any domestic uses without paying that double duty penalty. So that includes things like scrap and excess material. So if you have scrap and excess material, you have to account for that in your letter under the terms of the TIB. If you, if it's items that can still be used and aren't just scrap, then you have to export those items as well as the thing that you are manufacturing. Yeah, and another, another way to um, defer duty payments is to make use of a bonded warehouse. And you use a bonded warehouse to, to stage and store your goods prior to needing them for manufacturing. So unlike regular warehouses, uh, the goods can be stored in that bonded warehouse without filing the consumption entry and without paying the duties until the goods are actually needed. So you own the merchandise, you paid the foreign supplier for those goods, but you don't pay the additional costs until you pull them out of that bonded warehouse and, and are ready to use them for manufacturing. It's sort of like a semi-consignment arrangement where the, the seller is not involved in that consignment nature and it's only having to do with uh, the duty aspect of it. Um, but you can, uh, you can use that bonded warehouse. Uh, you can buy the materials in bulk. You can buy several containers worth, keep them in the bonded warehouse and not pay duty on the entirety of that shipment um, and just only pay the duty on one pallet at a time as you need it. Um, bonded warehousing is generally more expensive than other means of storage. Uh, so those additional costs need to be weighed against that, that duty savings opportunity. But there are a lot of strategic buying mechanisms that you can put in place to uh, secure uh, a significant amount of goods at a relatively low cost up front, store them in the bonded warehouse, only pay the duty when you need, when you actually need the inventory and uh, avoid a lot of, or, or defer at least uh, a lot of that duty until it's time to actually um, pay it when you need, it, need to use it for manufacturing. And generally by that time, you've been paid by your seller or your customer uh, so that you can cover those costs. So bonded warehouses are a good tool for balancing out the um, cash layout versus the cash received from your customers. Um, they're also useful, uh, bonded warehouses are also useful, particularly when uh, some of the imported merchandise uh, ends up being re-exported in the same condition. So if you have uh, stores in Canada or Mexico, for example, um, you can bring in goods into a bonded warehouse in the U.S., split the shipment into its necessary pieces, move the export pieces out of the country at whatever point um, without ever having, pay, having to pay duty on those goods uh, when they landed in, in the warehouse and were kind of split. Um, so that allows you to only pay, on, pay duty on the stuff that's staying in the U.S. <clears throat> Bonded warehouses are also a lot more common in other countries that have uh, a value added tax or a GST uh, because while the goods are in the bonded warehouse, not only do you not have to pay duty, but you don't have to pay taxes as well. So that's a, it's a very good tool in foreign markets. Uh, it's still useful in the U.S., but it doesn't, we don't have that same tax burden here, uh, VAT burden. Another tool that you have in your, in your quiver here is uh, the foreign trade zones. Uh, and they're, they're a pretty unique tool uh, that, that can be leveraged by U.S. manufacturers. Uh, within very strict limits, they can allow a manufacturer to bring raw material into the country without paying duty, manufacture those goods into a new item of commerce, and then import or re-export that finished good. And that new item, um, no, new item of commerce is what you'll actually be paying duty on, not the raw material that you brought in. So for, for as long as it's in that foreign trade zone, it, you're not paying duty on it. You can modify and manipulate those goods and then import that finished good. Uh, and if it's got a different HTS with a different uh, rate of duty on it, that's the rate of duty that you would pay. Uh, this is really useful for situations where we have uh, inverted tariffs. It's a term where uh, the raw materials or component parts are dutiable at a higher rate than the finished product. Um, so this, this foreign trade zone manipulation uh, is a very, very useful tool for keeping that, uh, that higher rate of duty off of your books and you're only paying the lower rate of duty on that finished good. And under specific conditions, uh, manufacturers can actually designate portions of their facilities as foreign trade zones uh, to allow for that manufacturing process to take place on your premises. 
the burdens of doing that are, are pretty high and they need to be carefully considered. And it's not, certainly not a, a Friday to Monday uh, type of transition. You're looking at a minimum of six months, probably a year to, to get those um, parameters in place and get CVP to approve that. But that can be a long-term um, huge boost to your, your cost position by having your own facility designated as a free trade zone do the manufacturing on site with your people, have your own quality control and quality analysis done uh, internally. And um, it, can be, it can really be a, a business redefining opportunity. Definitely do not enter into that um, without doing a, a cost benefit analysis. So now I'll run through some of the ways that you can file to recover duties if you've already paid them. Oh, sorry. You're good. All right. So one of one of the ones that we hear about a lot is drawback. So it drawbacks the act of recovering duty that was paid when an item or a similar substitute item is imported and then it's exported or destroyed. It was first established in 1789. So it's been around a while. And Customs says that about $2 billion annually goes unclaimed for duty drawback. Either it's overlooked, people think they're ineligible, or the cost benefit analysis is unfavorable. So exporters can claim drawback even if they're not the importer who paid duty, but you do need some documentation for that. There's three main types of drawback. The first one really makes sense and that's rejected drawback. So that's when you bring an item into the United States and then when you open it up you realize it doesn't meet your specs or it won't work for the purpose that you bought it or in some way it's flawed and then you just write a letter certifying that you return it to the sender or you destroy it because there's plenty of circumstances where if something is flawed enough, the manufacturer says, it's not worth it to me to pay $6,000 to bring it back, just destroy it. So you can do that, make sure that you're doing it with customs knowledge and approval, and then you can recover the duty you paid when you imported that item. Unused drawback is when you import something or something very similar to it, and then you either export it or destroy it just because you're not using it. So that might be that you uh, purchase a bunch of clothing items that you import to the United States, and then you export it to your distributor in Canada or Europe, wherever, without ever using those clothing articles and then you can recover the duty you paid upon import. Now, this is less common because a lot of the time, if you know you're gonna need something in another country, you may just have it drop shipped to that location instead of bringing it into the US. But we see it a lot with exports to Canada and Mexico because if your distribution hub is in the United States, you would do that. And there's two different types there. One's direct ID and one's substitution. And under direct ID, you would use a serial number, a lot number, or an accounting method like first in, first out to account to customs that it's the exact same product that you imported and then exported. And then there's also substitution where you can tell customs, hey, I can't swear to you that it's the same exact t-shirt but I imported some t-shirts and I exported some t-shirts. So I'm gonna recover duty on the t-shirts that I imported by proving to you that I exported some. And then there's manufacturing drawback where you bring something in and then you manufacture it in some way and then you export the manufactured item and you can recover the duty you paid for the raw materials when you export the finished good that you made. And that also has direct ID and substitution. But it has a few more hoops because you have to make sure that your production process matches up with one of the general manufacturing rulings that Customs has published that describe the way that you manufacture. If it doesn't, then you can 
request your own specific manufacturing ruling and that tends to be kind of a long process. So uh, one of the cool things about it is that the Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act or TEFTIA updated drawback a lot. Uh, now you can do substitution at eight digits of the HTS Everything has the same time frame. It's five years from the time you import to the time you claim. You can recover taxes and fees on manufacturing drawback, not just unused drawback. And you don't need certificates of delivery the way you used to with manufacturing drawback. So it streamlined it. It's now in 19 CFR 190. It's called modernized drawback to make sure that you understand. Uh, and it's the last remaining export promotion program that's sanctioned by the WTO. And so there are specific fees, taxes, and duties that you can recover and that you can't. And bad news up front, you can't recover anti-dumping or countervailing duties via drawback. So you can't import something that's subject to anti-dumping and subsequently export it and get back all that money. But you can recover the duty that you paid, uh, whether that's ad valorem or specific. In most cases, harbor maintenance fee, and in most cases, merchandise processing fee, and some taxes as well. Now, with drawback, you do have to be really careful to meet all of the rules. And we recommend using experts to, at a minimum, set up your program. Sometimes they can set it up if your situation is simple enough that you can run your drawback program. The government, just like us, doesn't like giving money back. So they will spend a lot of time reviewing to make sure that you're telling the truth and you should get your money back under the rules. Uh, exports to Canada and Mexico are a little bit funky, especially if the exported items are NAFTA or USMCA eligible. So you want to keep an eye out for that. And also keep in mind that things are still getting ironed out from the TEFTIA changes and sometimes customs can be slow on implementation or processing. That's an understatement. I'm being kind. Then there's all sorts of post-entry corrections. So there's 520D, which is when maybe you imported an item and you didn't have a free trade agreement document in hand, in this case, NAFTA or USMCA, and you then get that document and you can go back and say, hey, Customs, I actually could have imported this free of duty. Please kindly refund my duty. And they will. Then there's post summary corrections. And those are corrections that you should use if you find changes in the value of the items. If you maybe you uh, imported something at the cost that was on the invoice and you discover that there's all sorts of non dutiable charges on there that you were paying duty on freight or brokerage or that kind of thing. You can file a post summary correction to get that updated. Now, post summary corrections have to be filed usually within about 314 days of import because they need to be done 20 days before the item, the entry is set to liquidate. Then there's protests. They're really similar, but they extend the deadline that you have to file to 180 days past liquidation. So instead of having to do it 20 days before liquidation, you have up to 180 days after. And then reconciliation, and you would use reconciliation in circumstances where you have recurring value situations. Maybe you manufacture at a maquila in Mexico, and when you bring things in, there's no sale because you're bringing them back to your US division and they'll then be sold domestically. So in that case, there's no sale, you can't use transaction pricing, and you would then use reconciliation once you have accurate value. You can also use reconciliation for things like NAFTA if you don't know whether your goods qualify for NAFTA at that time. Okay, and so uh, we're getting close to the tail end of the webinar here. We're talking really quickly about some of the methods and practices we can use to 
bring about some of these preference programs into our organizations. And some of the minimum standards that I would expect uh, any company that is going to be taking advantage of these programs would put in place are going to be a procedural baseline, um, establishing a role alignment practice, and a strict adherence to the program's requirements. So what I'm talking about from the procedural baseline perspective is anytime you're going to take advantage of a regulatory program, particularly if it results in keeping money out of Uncle Sam's pocket, uh, you want to follow a documented baseline for successful execution. That means policies, that means procedures, that means work instructions. Um, basically, uh, all or virtually all the programs we talked about today have explicit requirements, uh, including record keeping, including document uh, re re retention, uh, evidentiary thresholds that you have to meet, related practices that require you to be able to prove your position. Uh, these procedures help you establish those expectations so that you can continue functioning within normal operating standards, regardless of the evolving circumstances in your organization, whether you're changing suppliers, whether you have turnover, uh, you wanna make sure that you have that baseline so that you're not violating the rules of these programs and subjecting yourself to penalties. Uh, so anytime you, you undertake one of these programs, there is additional burden on you to adhere to the requirements. Role alignment is really talking about um, ensuring that the right people are taking the right actions in the right ways. Uh, this means developing SOPs and service level agreements for your suppliers and your brokers and your forwarders, communicating these out to them, making sure that they're following them by, by checking what they're doing um, and, and having regular meetings. Uh, it means coordination with senior management. Uh, roping in legal and finance, uh, talking to your supply chain folks, your logistics folks, your procurement folks, your salespeople, any other arm of your organization to know that, to ensure that they know their role and how what they do aligns with what you're trying to accomplish in order to minimize uh, this cost position and maintain that competitive advantage. It, it helps everyone be successful if they all know what's going on. Uh, and then adherence to program requirements. You have to recognize and you have to meet every requirement outlined for that program. Whatever that program happens to be. If it's drawback, you have to make sure that you're following the drawback compliance program rules that are outlined in the regs. Uh, if it's free trade agreements, uh, you, have, you have to make sure that you're uh, basing your claim on a certificate that's in hand at the time the claim is made and that you have documentation to support the claim as outlined in regulations. For foreign trade zones, that means regular inspections, thorough inventory control systems, verifiable evidence uh, for reconciliation on the appropriate pricing arrangements that you have in place with your with your customers and with your supplier. Um, so there's, there's a lot that you have to do in order to ensure that you have met all of those program requirements. And then there's some best practices that we uh, strongly recommend that, that uh, organizations put in place. It's not strictly uh, in, in service of doing preference programs, but uh, generally uh, developing something like a compliance council, this is one of my favorites, um, if you establish that council, uh, meet regularly to discuss existing practices as well as new opportunities, and then also use that time to review audit results, determine next steps on a rotational basis. Uh, otherwise, uh, basically share that burden of maintaining and advancing your compliance picture and your compliance programs overall. Uh, it, it really positions you to, to be a stronger um, the company in the marketplace and allow you to take advantage of a whole host of opportunities that you may not recognize today without having those discussions and having the right people uh, on board. And none of the programs that we've talked about today are set it and forget it. Uh, they all require maintenance. They all require upkeep. And that upkeep takes dedicated time and attention from more than one resource. Uh, it can't ever just be on one sole individual. Uh, and I, I'm a strong advocate of bringing other people into the, the discussions and having them all be part of the process. And don't, don't limit yourself to just the trade compliance insiders. Don't just make it the trade compliance team of, of three individuals. Uh, my recommendation is actually to loop in people that are uh, in often overlooked areas of the organization. Uh, I like to include production personnel in these sorts of councils. Um, production personnel, typically have no direct responsibility for uh, compliance, but their awareness of these programs actually empowers them to do a better job. And that passive understanding uh, allows people to really get a, a grasp of the way things work and why they work that way, which is just as important in my opinion. And when they, when they understand those things, they're more likely to participate in the effort rather than go against it. And that's, that's one of the key ways to avoid problems uh, being made for no reason. And once people get it, they're much, much likely to be uh, on board. Uh, regular audits are an essential uh, piece of any compliance program. Uh, all audits should be based on existing procedures and practices. 
Uh, I would recommend avoiding over-reliance on self-audit. You want to have an outsider evaluate existing practices against the documented procedures. And that's a great way to find inconsistencies either in your practice or in your procedure, and you can bring those things into alignment. Um, if, if you find a gap, it's either going to be the procedures the problem or your practices are the problem. People aren't following the procedures, and, and you have to fix those things. Um, you also want to zero in the regulatory aspects outside of those written processes. You want to recognize what has changed in the regulations. Anyone with drawback in place before the TFTEA, TFTEA, um, they should have done a regulatory assessment of existing practices in order to make those adjustments. And they should also be conducting a reevaluation right around now based on the evolving legislation that's been going on to make sure that the current expectations that Customs has put out are in alignment with current practices. And at a minimum, uh, audits should evaluate documentary evidence uh, used to support participation in those programs and do a cradle to grave assessment on at least one uh, particular transaction, go through the entire the gamut from start to finish, and then always come away with at least one action item. Um, audits, uh, in my estimation, are not successful if they haven't thoroughly evaluated and identified an improvement that can be made. Not a bad thing, it's just part of the, the process. And then lastly, Re-examine your costs and your operating plans. Um, supply chains change, suppliers change. The regulations change. Uh, things that were a good idea five years ago may not be a good idea today. Programs that weren't viable two years ago may be viable today. Being on, uh, on that compliance council, I would want people to reevaluate some of these opportunities. Maybe you looked at drawback 10 years ago, and it was just uh, too much work to, to comply with drawback and there wasn't enough money on the table. But since then, uh, you've grown your export market, you've expanded your, your import um, suppliers, uh, and the benefits now outweigh the costs. And having that as a rotational consideration so that you're, you're evaluating those opportunities uh, allows you to be best positioned to succeed. Don't just do things because that's the way they've always been done. Okay, Q&A. We've got a few minutes left here. Um, we'll continue on um, after the webinar ends uh, to answer some questions, but there is, uh, there is one posted, this one's to Joe um, from Mallory. Uh, the question is, are tariff rate quotas also limited by the amount the full US brings in or is it tied to just the organization? Really good question. Those are also limited by the amount that everybody in the US brings in. And so a lot of what we see is that uh, quotas fill up at the beginning of the year and importing um, people will change their importing status so they bring in everything that they need for the year at the beginning of the year instead of waiting until potentially that that quota is filled. Yeah, yeah that's um, definitely one of the one of the more challenging ones to um, stay on top of you have to be alert to what the rest of your industry is doing. <clears throat> And that, that takes some um, attention yeah. in collaboration with your broker, yeah. <clears throat> um, it, uh, so Joe, you, you talked on drawback uh, for a little bit. I see a question here. Um, how do I determine which type of drawback is going to be the better option? That's kind of open-ended. So um, hopefully you can navigate through that. So it wouldn't be your determination. It's going to depend on the circumstances of your practices. So if you're not manufacturing something, you would not use manufacturing drawback. And if you're not returning something because it's broken, you wouldn't use rejected merchandise, if that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Makes sense to me. Good. Uh, so Mike, how would I find a bonded warehouse if I think that that's something that I want to explore? Oh yeah, finding the bonded warehouse is often a, um, a challenge in and of itself. Um, I've had the most success by reaching out to my broker, my forwarder, and explaining the situation that I'm, that I'm trying to, to do. And they're, they're gonna have access to those resources. Forwarders and brokers um, are often 3PLs themselves, may have a bonded warehouse on their own premises or a partnership with a bonded warehouse. So definitely talk to your, to your forwarder or your broker first. Okay, I think uh, we're right at 11 o'clock. Um, oh, another question's coming in. Uh, are you aware of individual companies with minimal amount of import taking advantage? Um, taking advantage okay. of the efforts programs? If, uh, I'll jump on that one. Um, so um, the advantage in the duty preference programs um, is going to be 
determined by how much cost outlay versus um, cost savings that you're that you're coming in with. And and yes, the answer to the question is yes. I have uh, we have very small or we have clients that import a very small amount of goods, but that working capital for them is ex is extremely important because of their size. Uh, not just it's not just big dollars on the table. It's um, the the meaning of those dollars to that company. So avoiding that duty on all of those imports is essential to them. Recovering that duty on the drawback side is essential to them in order to continue operating at the, uh, at the scale that they're trying to grow. And it is a duty, duty preference programs are a recovery or a, a growth tool. Uh, they're meant to help give you that advantage either in reaching uh, foreign markets or in uh, being able to grow your, your organization by leveraging your dollars and putting them to work for you. Yep. Rather than giving them to the government. So if you if you have any more questions, please feel free to email us. Melissa is great at passing those along to us if there's questions that come in that she doesn't have on hand. And the next slide has some of the items that we're going to hand out. So these will get emailed out to you along with the slides and the recording. And don't forget to send us your CCS or CES number and we'll register you to get credits for this webinar. Thanks for sticking it out. It was fun to talk and uh, send us any questions that you have. Thank you all. Have a good day.